Good morning, and welcome to Aberdeen First United Methodist Church's Sunday worship, to worship and praise God. This is the third Sunday of Easter, and some are viewing it online, and some are present in the sanctuary. We are glad that we can do it both ways. This week, as we celebrate special birthdays or anniversaries, um, Gordon and Elaine celebrated their anniversary in heaven this year, this last week. And for announcements, this is Native American Sunday as well. It is one of six special offerings that we collect as a United Methodist Church and send in to conference. <laughs>
Good morning. I'm Carolyn Hardy. And I'm Bill Hardy. And we are your lay readers this morning. Please join us with the call to worship as we read it responsibly. Christ asked Peter if he loved him. Peter Peter affirmed three times his love of of the Lord. Lord. Christ asked us if we love him. We We affirm affirm our love love of the Lord Lord in our worship. worship. Christ calls us to demonstrate our love in service. Lord, help us to witness to your love in the ways in which we care for others. And now our opening hymn for today, Lamb of God. Let us pray the prayer of confession. We rejoice in the wonder of your resurrection, O Christ, but then tend to sink back into our old ways of thinking, behaving, responding to people's needs. We can dance with the angels and all humankind on Easter Sunday, but the days following the day of resurrection cause us to slip back into apathy or despair. Forgive us when we so easily become distracted by our own cares and worries that we ignore the needs of others around us. Forgive us when we forget your power and love for us. Charge us up, O Lord. Set our hearts to dancing. Give us a spirit for rejoicing, willing hearts and hands for helping, and voices for praising you forever. Amen. And in Jesus' name, Your sins are forgiven. Sing, shout, rejoice. Jesus calls you to serve because of his love for you. He believes in you and all the gifts you have been given. Do not be afraid. Christ is with you always. Amen.
Our children's message this morning has to do with our scripture lesson and it is when Jesus meets the disciples at the seaside. And several of Jesus' disciples were gathered beside the Sea of Galilee and the group included Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel and James and John, the sons of Zebedee. And suddenly Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll come too, the others said. So they got in the boat and they fished all night, but caught nothing. As the sun came up, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't make out who it was. And Jesus called out to them, have you caught any fish? Not a thing, the disciples called back. Throw your nets on the right side of the boat and you'll catch some. Did they do it? Yes, they did. And did they catch any fish? They caught so many fish that they couldn't even pull the net into the boat. And then the disciple that Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. And when Peter heard that, he jumped into the water and headed for shore. The others stayed with the boat and dragged the loaded net to the shore. And when they got there, they found Jesus cooking breakfast fish over a charcoal fire and some bread. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus said, and Peter dragged the net to the shore, and there were 153 large fish. Now come and have some breakfast, Jesus said, and then Jesus served them fish and bread. Oh my, it just doesn't get any better than that. Breakfast on the beach with the risen Lord? What would have happened if the disciples had refused to throw their nets on the right-hand side of the boat? They would have missed out on a wonderful breakfast on the beach with Jesus. What happens when you and I refuse to do the things Jesus has called us to do? We miss out on the wonderful blessings that he wants for us. Let us pray. Father, we know that you have wonderful blessings in store for us when we faithfully follow our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our prayer is that we will always be obedient disciples. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It comes that time for us to be able to share our joys and concerns. And we know that as you have been going through many things, that your prayers are being answered as well. And may you lift them up as we lift them up here. We would like to ask for continued healing for Heather and for Christine, who both had surgeries. And we would like to ask compassion and love and prayers for Margaret, who is still adjusting to the death of her husband. And for Barb and Bob Giese, as they continue to adjust to living at Montesano Rehab. And for Elaine, as she adjusts to not getting around as well. We ask for prayers this coming week for Carolyn as well. She will be having 
shoulder surgery on Tuesday and will be returning home on Wednesday. And we know that we continue to pray for those in Ukraine and Russia area, that you can bring peace and calm to the area and save lives. And for those who are homeless, even though it is starting to be spring, we still are having a lot of chilly nights and we hope that they find warm each evening and continue to have food to fill their stomachs and be nourished each day. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, we know that you are right there with us just as you were with the disciples so many years ago. And as we lift up our burdens from our heart, what an easier load that we carry. Because in your hands, those burdens that are on our heart get solved so much better than if we try to solve them all by ourselves. We ask for healing for those that we have mentioned here and there. And we also ask for your hands to be with the surgeons on Tuesday. We ask for love and compassion as we continue to grieve the loss of the Schnees. And we also ask for prayers for Wayne, one of our former pastors who had a stroke this last week. And he also is going through rehab very close to home so Sylvia can go each day to be with him through the therapy. And he is not paralyzed, but he is needing help with walking and with speaking. So be with Sylvia and Wayne both through this time. And we ask that you be with all children of God, which is everyone, no matter where we are in the world and no matter what our plight is. Guide and be with us as we walk in your steps. In your precious name, amen. Hi, I'm Carolyn Hardy, and I'm here to share with you what has been a long time tradition in our church. It is Blanket Sunday, and next week we choose to honor our mothers on Mother's Day through a simple blanket that can bring so much comfort like a mother does to us. A mother's touch. Mothers are amazing. Through a simple touch, they can bring so much comfort. Patrick Walker, Senior Community Engagement Specialist of Church World Service, fondly remembers the comfort his 90-year-old mother, Pauline, brought him as a child. She would cover him with a warm blanket, her arms wrapped tightly around him, creating a cocoon where he felt warm, safe, comforted, and most important, loved. Now through CWS Blankets, Patrick and his mother strive to share that same feeling with others. The simple gesture of giving a blanket to someone in need is an act of compassion with enormous significance. Each person wrapped in a blanket is enveloped in a sense of warmth, safety, and love. It's a priceless feeling, just like a mother's touch. Last year, because of your generosity, hosting a CWS Blanket Sunday, 100,472 blankets were blankets and kits were shared with our neighbors. This Mother's Day, our congregation can celebrate mothers everywhere while continuing to give that priceless feeling of love and comfort to families around the world. We've seen these blankets used in homeless shelters, refugees wrapped in these blankets around the world. They've been handed out at food banks. They've even been used as a door covering to cover an opening to keep the cold out. 
They are more than just a blanket. They are an act of love. A simple donation of $10 will purchase a blanket to honor or remember a special person. Send your donation to Aberdeen First United Methodist Church, 100 East 2nd Street, Aberdeen, Washington, 98520, or use the mobile app and designate it for Blanket, Blanket Sunday. And if you wish to dedicate it in honor or memory of a loved one or two, note that also. Thank you, and God bless you all. As I mentioned earlier, this is Native American Sunday, and so there is special offering today for American, Amer Native American Sunday. It is one of the six special offerings that we collect in the United Methodist Church to help various areas throughout the world. And you can send in your offering or donations to 100 East 2nd Street, Aberdeen, Washington, 98520. Or you can bring it to church on Sunday morning and put it in the offering plate. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, Native Americans were the first here in our lands and we have many in our area, some still actively involved in their communities and others who have gone by the wayside over the years. May we know that they have contributed many gifts here on earth for us. And may we be blessed by the resources that we are able to return to you. We also are blessed because of the gifts you give to us, our presence at church, our prayers, our gifts, our witnessing, May we ever be with you. In your precious name, amen.
couple of weeks, our gospel lesson has come from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, the story of Jesus' resurrection and appearing twice to the disciples. This week, we're going to continue with chapter 21 of John, verses 1 through 19, and this time I will be reading from the Good News Bible. After this, Jesus appeared once more to his disciples at Lake Tiberias. This is how it happened. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathanael, the one from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples of Jesus, were all together. Simon Peter said to the others, I am going fishing. We will come with you, they told him. So they went out in a boat, but all that night they did not catch a thing. As the sun was rising, Jesus stood at the water's edge, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then he asked them, Young men, haven't you caught anything? Not a thing, they answered. He said to them, Throw your net out on the right side of the boat, and you will catch some. So they threw the net out, and could not pull it back in, because they had caught so many fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Peter heard that it was the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken his clothes off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples came to shore in the boat, pulling the net full of fish. They were not very far from land, about a hundred yards away. When they stepped ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and some bread. Then Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net ashore full of big fish, a hundred and fifty-three in all. Even though there were so many, still the net did not tear. Jesus said to them, Come and eat. None of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. So Jesus went over, took the bread, and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This then was the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from death. After they had eaten, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these others do? Yes, Lord, he answered. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Take care of my lambs. A second time Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he answered. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Take care of my sheep. A third time Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter became sad, because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? And so he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Take care of my sheep. I am telling you the truth. When you were young, you used to get ready and go anywhere you wanted to. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will tie you up and take you where you don't want to go. In saying this, Jesus was indicating the way in which Peter would die and bring glory to God. Then Jesus said to him, Follow me. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.
Our gospel lesson this morning is called Follow Me. There are over 300,000 Christian churches in the U.S. Some are antique, some are new, some are plain, some are very ornate, some are not plugged in, and some of the ones plugged in keep their light mainly to themselves. God likes best the ones where the light shines out. But what does it mean to shine out the light into the world of ours? How do we shine the light in a world frozen by fear, flawed by distrust, and fractured by dissension? A world every day helplessly teetering on the edge of disaster? But this was the world of the first century. It was the world the first disciples of Jesus faced. It is also the world faced by all of Jesus' 21st century disciples. We cannot control or contain such chaos. We can only remain faithful and follow Jesus, whatever comes our way. We can only shine our light into the darkness. The 21st chapter of John's Gospel was probably not written by the author of the 20, first 20 chapters, but the 21st chapter of John's Gospel has always been a part of John's Gospel. The community of faith that saw to the preservation and presentation of the Gospel, written by the beloved Gospel, recognized this final word as a Jesus in every age. In today's Gospel text, both Peter and John, the beloved disciple, are given special attention, but there is also focus on the future. The beloved, the beloved disciple recognizes the Lord from far away by his voice alone, and Peter responds to the announcement, it is the Lord, by plunging into the sea and swimming to Jesus' side. Both these disciples demonstrate a faith without fear. They commit themselves by word, John, or by deed, Peter, to confessing and embracing the risen Lord. Before these disciples dove headfirst into their commitment, they received a sign. At Jesus' directive, they cast their net off the starboard side of their boat, and after a night of fishing futilely, they suddenly are faced with a net full to bursting. It is at Jesus' word, with Jesus' specific directive, that the disciples catch goes from nada to not to be believed. The full to bursting not to be believed net holds 153 fish, a specific number that is given biblical scholars way too much fun trying to figure out and pin down. Basically though, this is a bunch of fish, far more than any ordinary catch might expect. It is a divinely mandated bumper crop. Jesus' disciples responded in obedience to Jesus' word, and the result was unexpected abundance. When St. Jerome exe exegeted this text, he claimed the 153 fishes represented all the species in the water. This means that Jesus' net, the gospel, was to be cast and gather all the peoples of this world. Again, the message is a huge harvest, one that exceeds all human expectations. But besides the huge number of fish that were caught early in the morning, there is another huge detail to the story. Did you notice that the net never broke? The net held. However, many fish Jesus knew, however, many fish Jesus knew the disciples would cast out their net for. The immense hull did not rupture the net, the net held, and the boat did not capsize. The fishing mission was filled to the max, but the net the disciples cast held fast. Instead of fussing about figures, it seems that detail is the most pertinent piece of information about this remarkable catch. The net held. Every one of those 153 fish eventually were brought to shore by Peter. If in the Johannian Gospel this is Jesus' final earthly act, it is completely typical. 
Everyone gets included. No one is excluded or cut off. Whoever piles into the pool is welcomed into the fullness of the community. Whether these 153 fish represented all the nations of the world or just a big boatload of fish, the significance is the same. They all were welcomed into. They all became a part of the Jesus community. There are lots of fish. Some would like to cut loose these days, slit the net and let them go. But Jesus' final harvest in John's Gospel does not let a single species slip away. Jesus' invitation is to all nations, all fish, all pure persons, regardless of who they are or where they came from. That is our disciple directive today and every day, to take that message everywhere and to know that the net holds. This is what this epilogue of John 21 is. It is a P.S. I love you to Peter, to John, to the Johenian community, and to all the generations of Jesus' followers that have come and are to come. That means you and me. P.S. I love you, even when you don't recognize my voice. P.S. I love you, even when you deny me in fear and bewilderment. P.S. I love you, even when you don't let my light shine or your light shine. P.S. I love you, no matter where you, where in the pile of 153 fish you find yourself. P.S. I love you, and walk with you, and make a fire for you, and feed you at dawn after a cold night at sea. P.S. I love you, and showed you when I was crucified, died, and resurrected for you. P.S. I love you, because I created you, and you are my artwork. P.S. I love you, my little fish. P.S. I love you. That is the general theme and tone of John 21. Now a whole new ending appears. While the Johannian authorship of this final chapter is hotly disputed, its authenticity to John's Gospel is not. There are no existing manuscripts that lack these verses. Clearly, they were a part of the Johannian community's oral and written tradition from its beginning. What John 21 offers is not just another post-resurrection encounter with Jesus. It is a final word of faithfulness and commitment for those who now followed Jesus because of the words and witness of the beloved disciple. There is no textual indication that the seven disciples engaged in the fishing trip had fallen away from faith or had failed to follow through on the commission that they had been given in 20, 22 to 23. They have returned to Galilee, of course, but it was their home. They are fishing, of course, but fishing had been the full-time occupation of some of these disciples. Even as Paul continued to be a tent maker, these metaphysical fishers also continued to cast their nets for the real deal. After all, they still needed to eat and feed their families. The author of chapter 21 sets his scene at daybreak, a mark of continuity with the Easter morning discovery of the empty tomb. Despite the later upper room appearances of Jesus to the disciples, as these fisherless fishermen approach the shore, they see Jesus standing there, but do not recognize him. Yet Jesus's, Jesus addresses them both in a familiar way and authoritatively as children. Their immediate, obedient response to Jesus' directive suggests that they are meant to understand that even if the disciples were lit hazy about who was addressing them, they heard the voice of one with authority over themselves and their actions and acted accordingly. These actions are rewarded with a net so filled with fish that it was impossible to haul aboard. The disciple whom Jesus loved repeats his seeing and believing response first experienced at the empty tomb. 
He instantly asserts and announces to Simon Peter, It is the Lord. Peter, always more a man of actions than words, responds by jumping into the water and heading for shore. Oh, and another thing. The witness detail that Peter put on more clothing before hitting the beach implies that unlike King David, Jesus' disciples preferred not to dance naked before his Lord. Peter's modesty also recalls the actions of Adam and Eve, whom, having sinned, sought to hide their shame from God. Given his threefold denial of Jesus, Peter certainly had reason to feel his own shamefulness. The other disciples managed to pilot the boat and its enormous catch to the shore. They find that a breakfast is already being prepared for them. The one who had called them children is now offering to feed them. In fact, to serve them. Before this buffet gets underway, however, Jesus calls upon and designates Peter as his sous chef. The fish, singular, that is upon the grill will not feed all the disciples. So Jesus instructs the ever active Peter to bring some more from the prolific catch that had just been made. In his exuberance for his task, Peter brings in the entire netful, a total of 153 fish. The number of the disciples catch, therefore, was seen as an all-inclusive, universal number. This assertion by St. Jerome was that this specific number demonstrated that all the peoples of the world, all the fish in the sea, were to be caught by the gospel. Despite the enormity of this catch, the net does not break. It stretches and strengthens to accommodate all that it encounters and encompasses. Following Jesus' leadership does not result in disaster. Rather, it brings great abundance. The redemption of Peter is the subject of 21, 15 through 19. Despite Simon Peter's obvious first follower role throughout the gospel, he is yet to live down his threefold denial of Jesus on the night of his mass that his master was arrested. It is then with mathematical precision that Jesus presses the point of Peter's loyalty and love three times, asking Simon, son of John, do you love me? The first two times Peter responds openly and eagerly, welcoming the opportunity to express his love and devotion. By the third time, however, it had to be apparent to Peter exactly what Jesus was doing, and he was hurt by his own conscience, by his own memory of his previous threefold failure to assert his relationship with Jesus, his Lord. And Peter confesses, you know everything. Jesus knows his denials and desertion, and he knows his yearning to confess his love. But here, with each assertion of his love, Jesus empowers Peter with a distinctive, ongoing mission to feed his, my lambs, tend my sheep, and feed my sheep. Despite his failure of faith and nerve on the night of Jesus' arrest, Peter's commitment to Christ is itself resurrected and reaffirmed on this walk on the beach. And Jesus proclaims, If it is my will, John would remain alive and declares that for Peter, for John, and all present and future disciples, their role is singular. Follow me. Thanks be to God. Amen.
And now we will have communion. And if you will have your bread or cracker and liquid ready. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give, give thanks, thanks and praise. praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing <clears throat> always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, who sent your Son to earth, but also took him back up to heaven to be with you, alive here on earth and alive in heaven. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, who came to earth as a human, experienced all the emotions of a human, was obedient, and came back to you, just as obedient. And by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. And on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread and gave thanks to you, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and again he gave thanks to you. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us, as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ, Christ is risen, Christ, Christ, Christ will, will come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on those of us gathered here, those of us gathered at home, and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. And by your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet, through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father... Amen who aren't in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And as we have one loaf, it shows that we are all one in Christ. But we break this loaf to show that we are to share it with everyone. And likewise, we have one cup of salvation, one cup that is poured out for everyone. The body of Christ given for you, dear and the blood of his salvation poured out for you. The blood of Christ. Amen. Amen. And for those of you at home, if you will take your bread or cracker, this is the body of Christ given for you, and the blood of his salvation poured out for you. Amen.
And now as we receive the benediction and blessing. You are a people of the resurrection. You know the powerful love of God. Go into God's world proclaiming hope, peace, and joy in the name of the risen Lord. Remember who you are and remember to whom you belong. Mm -hmm.